Hello and welcome back to my course Amiga Hardware Programming in C. In this episode I will explain the concepts of the sprite hardware and how to apply them in order to display sprites on the screen. In the previous episode I explained how the Amiga uses its playfield hardware in order to display bitmap data on the screen. The Amiga also supports hardware sprites. Sprites are handled independently from the playfield hardware and they don't require CPU either which makes them a great fit for smaller moving and possibly animated objects like for example player or enemy characters, bullets, mouse pointers or similar things. You can use sprites for many other things once you understand the rules and limitations. But let me first explain why hardware sprites make sense for a machine like the Amiga. In a system without hardware sprites, objects have to be copied into an image buffer which is then displayed on the screen using display hardware. Many computer systems use this method. So in order to move and animate a game object, the game's code needs to clear the area that was occupied by that object's previous state and then draw the new state at the new position. Modern hardware can do this very quickly, even on higher resolutions. But on 80s machines, they only had a fraction of that computing power. So there would be less computing resources available for things like game logic or AI, for example. In a system with hardware sprites, the display hardware and the sprite hardware can share responsibilities. In this example, the display hardware draws the background while the sprite hardware places the game object on top of it without the need to explicitly erase the player object's individual animation phases. Amiga hardware sprites have the properties as shown here. It is possible to display up to 8 sprites per scan line. Each sprite can be 16 pixel wide and theoretically of any height. Each sprite can have 3 colors or up to 15 colors if you attach 2 of them. But more about that later. These are the custom chip register groups that are responsible for sprite display. The X stands for a number between 0 and 7 for each of the individual sprites. In this episode we actually only have to deal with the registers for the sprite data pointers. Ok, let's start writing actual code. As always I have published this episode's source code and utilities and you can find the link to those in the video's description. My idea for the example programs was using a fish tank as the background and drawing a bunch of fish using sprites. I will now briefly introduce the structure of the main program and every example program will follow this principal structure to keep everything consistent. If you watched the previous episodes in this course you will remember that we pulled the CIA port registers in order to wait for a mouse click. From now on, we will install our own input handler, which is more system friendly and flexible. This section sets up the playfield hardware to show the background image. And here we initialize the sprite pointers in the copy list to point to an empty sprite structure. As a C programmer, you might be tempted to set those to null, but we will see later why this won't work. This is a simple game loop. All it does is wait for the raster beam to reach the vertical blank position until the exit condition is true. In this case, this is when the user clicked the left mouse button. Let's take a look at the copper list since it defines what we will see on the screen. I have built it so that it starts with a block containing the sprite data pointers, then the definition of the display window, followed by the color palette, and then the pointers to the background image. Here we change the background color slightly so that it doesn't look quite as boring and then we finally end the copper list with two wait instructions. I've made it a habit of defining a few constants so I can later conveniently access certain parts of the copy list in my program. And this is how it looks like. Let's start working on getting our first sprite on the screen. To understand what we need to do, let me explain the data structure that is at the center of it all. The Amiga has 8 individual sprite DMA channels and here we will set sprite channel 0's data pointers to an array of 16-bit words. The first word 
corresponds to the sprite position register and the second one to the sprite control register. Following that are alternating lines where each word represents 16 pixels of the sprite's bit plane data. The image data is followed by two words which will either describe an additional multiplex sprite or are set to zero if there is no more data. Because once enabled, the sprite DMA will look for these two control words, we will have to point the unused sprite channels to an address containing two zero words to avoid unexpected effects. Here are the two initial words of the sprite data structure shown up close. As I mentioned, they each correspond to a sprite DMA channel's position and control registers. In this example, we assume sprite zero's data pointer is pointing at our structure. Most of the bits in these two words are used to specify a sprite's position and height and there is one bit to specify attached sprites, which we will look at later. H start and V start define the horizontal and vertical positions, while V stop tells the system at what line to stop fetching data, which is V start plus the sprite's height. These values all have a size of 9 bit. But be aware that H starts low bit is in the second word, while it is the high bit for V stop and V start. Otherwise, you might wonder why your sprite moves in steps of two pixels horizontally, as it happened to me once. When setting our sprite positions, we should be aware of the value of DIW start as it defines the top left corner of our display. So we know that the image data of each sprite consists of two bit planes. But which colors are actually used? It turns out that on the Amiga, the sprite DMA channels are organized such that 0 and 1, 2 and 3, 4 and 5, and 6 and 7 form a group. Each group uses three colors within the color register 16 to 31, as you can see in the displayed figure. The bit combinations that form the values 1, 2 and 3 result in their respective colors, while the value 0 indicates that the pixel will be transparent. I used a sprite to create a 16 by 8 PNG image of a clownfish, but use what feels right to you. All that matters is that you have a way to create data in the correct format. I wrote a small utility that can generate sprite data structures for the example programs in this course. For this example program, I am generating output data as C source code, so it is easier to follow what the program is doing. As you see, the palette is included as well as the sprite data structure. Note that my utility uses the first two control words such that the first control word contains the sprite's height. We can use that height information later when we set the sprite's positions. In order to show the sprite we just created, I made a few additions to our base program. First, I included the generated C source code and renamed the variables. Then I wrote a set sprite post function, which helps us placing the h start, v start, and v stop values in the right places in a more convenient manner. Finally, we set sprite channel 0's data pointer to the sprite data, copy the color information, and set the sprite's position to a place where we can actually see it. And this is the outcome of our changes. As you might have just seen, 16-bit white sprites are a little bit limiting when it comes to creating detailed characters, especially when art is not exactly your strength. We can improve on that by making characters that are 32 pixels wide. We achieve that by using two sprites, one for the left half and one for the right half. Great, so now I have more pixels available for making even uglier sprites. As a reminder, Sprites are grouped in terms of color assignment. So for this example, we will use the sprite channels 0 and 1 to share the color registers 17, 18 and 19. The utility that I have been using in the previous example is also capable of automatically generating two halves when it detects a 32 pixel wide source image. Using a larger clownfish image, we can now generate new C structures for our next example program. And these are the important changes in the example program. This is mainly additional code to display the right half of the fish. Let's see if that worked. Yep, alright. Let's step up our game. 
Having only three colors available severely limits using simple sprites for detailed characters. Fortunately, the Amiga hardware has the ability to attach two sprites in a group to each other, which results in a 15 color sprite. For this example, I have drawn a Mandarin Gobi, which I mainly picked because it falls into the category Colorful Blob, which is about as much as I can handle with my skills. Let's see how we can attach two sprites in a group to each other, in this case 0 and 1, to combine them into a sprite with 15 colors. For this, two things need to happen. First, we need to set the attach bit in the sprite control word. And second, both attached sprites need to have the same position and size. When these two conditions are true, the two sprites form a composite sprite with four bit planes. For review, I am showing the first two words of the sprite data structure so you can see which bit has to be set. The make sprites utility can handle 15 color sprites too. So when you feed it a 32 pixel wide 16 color PNG image, it will generate the four sprite data arrays as you would expect and their second control words will all have the attachment bit set. I skipped the changes to the example program this time, but it's just what you expect. It mainly sets the sprite data pointers and positions. And it looks like it worked. We will now be moving and animating the 15 color sprite we just created. Well, animating is somewhat of an overstatement, but technically speaking, animation is flipping between images and that's what we are going to do here. The idea is to move the sprite left and right and change the direction it points to once it reaches a certain position. We implement movement by updating the position values and direction changes by setting the pointer to the image that points in the opposite direction. This time I used the make sprites utility to generate binary files that are loaded into the example program instead of generating C code and paste it into the C program. Since it should be clear by now how the data looks like, we might as well just read it from disk to keep our source code short. Loaded the sprite data is implemented in the loader module, but aside from housekeeping information, the data just looks as we've seen so far. Since our fish consists of four sprites, I made an array of size four for each direction, so it is easier to manipulate them as a group. In the same vein, I also have functions for updating the sprite pointers and positions for each four part composite. In the main loop, we move our fish left and right, and if necessary, we change its directions. We do this in the vertical blanking phase, so our updates won't interfere with the sprite being displayed. And here are the results of what we've just done. In most cases, we are interested how objects are drawn on top of each other or whether they appear in front or behind background objects. We can control these aspects by carefully planning our object organization and setting a few bits in a hardware register. As a general rule, lower numbered sprites will always appear in front of higher numbered ones, so you might want to consider that when planning your game or demo. With respect to playfield graphics, we are a little bit more flexible. The BPLCon2 register contains two sets of three bits each to determine the placement of playfields with respect to the sprites. Since we are not using dual playfield mode, only playfield 2 matters to us. This table shows where the background graphics will be drawn dependent on the bit combination. Here are three examples to demonstrate this. In the first case, the bits are all set to zero, so the playfield graphics is drawn in front of all the sprites. In the second case, bit zero is set to one, so the clownfish, which consists of sprite 0 and 1, will be drawn in the front. And at last, with the bits 0 and 1 set, the goby, which consists of sprites 2, 3, 4 and 5, will be shown in front of the background graphics too. For this example, the most interesting changes are in the input handler, where we cycle through the priorities each time the right mouse button is clicked. Let's have a look at the example program. I am switching through the configurations of the priority bits so you can see their effect. Especially in games, it is important to know when objects collide with each other. The Amiga hardware provides a special register for that purpose named CLXDAT. It is convenient in that we can read the contents of this register and it will be automatically cleared after reading it. 
You can take all the combinations for collisions out of this table and I recommend you take a quiet minute to take a closer look at it. You can see which bits will be set depending on whether they are overlaps between sprites and or playfield graphics. I want to point out that it does not allow you to detect collisions between sprites within the same group. In the example program, I primarily wanted to show how we could read the collision register and react to a detected collision. For that purpose, I have set up two fish that are moving towards each other and stop once they collide. And this is what that looks like. I wanted to briefly touch on the topic of sprite multiplexing. The Amiga makes it rather easy to tell a sprite DMA channel to display more than one sprite within the same frame. The only requirement is that they need to be separated by at least one scan line. Do you still remember that the sprite data structure ends with a pair of words that are set to zero? Now to tell the sprite channel that we want to display another sprite below the first one, we just have to append another data array in its place. To illustrate this, let's look at the source code representation of the sprite data again. Conceptually, we just delete the two last words of the first array and append the second array after that. The second array's end words become the resulting data structure's new end words. Theoretically, we can repeat this process as many times as we want, but of course there are only so many lines in a frame. Let's take a look at this example program. I've used a 32 pixel wide character, so we actually feed multiplexing data to sprite channels 0 and 1. I also put borders at top and bottom of each sprite, so it's easier to see where they start and end. You can move the bottom sprite up and down using the cursor keys, so you can see the drawing behavior near the sprite seams. I hope this video has been somewhat helpful to you. Did you enjoy watching this or do you have any feedback? Please let me know in the comments. I'd also love to hear what kind of content you'd like to see in the future. As far as this series goes, the most obvious next topic would be the blitter. Please consider subscribing and activate notifications to get notified when I publish new content. Thanks for stopping by and until next time. For this, two things need to happen. First, we need to set the attach bed. <laughs> First, we need to set the attach. <laughs> okay, let's be. <laughs>